Oh, hey, how's it going? Didn't see you there. You must be here for the knife skills class. Well, I'll tell you what, if you got your first Japanese knife recently, or you've been working in the kitchen for a while, but you want to upgrade your skills, today we're gonna to cover all the basics, just simple stuff so you can be confident and effective and safe in the kitchen. All right, we're gonna do some knife skills. We probably need some knives. Whoop. So whatever you're using at home today is gonna to work great. Um, I've got a few knives that I'm gonna to use today. Hopefully show you how to use a variety of shapes and sizes. So I got a big guy. This is what I really like to use, 240 millimeter Guto. Got something a little smaller, a little more manageable, 210 millimeter Guto. Got my trusty Nakiri, my vegetable knife, and a Santoku, possibly the shape and size you're using at home. And then of course, a little petty paring knife just for those small jobs. So we're gonna start off with some really basic stuff, just basic safety and technique with your kitchen knife. And then we'll get into the more complex stuff, how to do different cuts and that kind of thing. So using a kitchen knife isn't hard or complicated, um, but there's a few basic skills that most people aren't taught early in life that can really upgrade your technique. Um, and there's a few things that a lot of people learn when they're young, when they first learn to cook, that are bad habits that can actually make it tougher to use your knife. Uh, so first of all, you wanna make sure that you have a sharp knife. Sharp knives are safer. It's like a well-tuned car. It's gonna drive exactly where you point it. If you point it in the wrong direction, obviously that's not a good thing, but if you take your time and use it properly, uh, it's gonna be far safer and far easier to use. Uh, dull knives tend to cause the most injuries and the worst injuries, as well as being frustrating and hard to control. So make sure your knife is sharp. If it isn't sharp, uh, get it sharpened or get a new knife. How you grip the knife is gonna make probably the biggest difference uh, as far as your cutting experience. And now this part of the knife is called the handle. This part's the blade, right? Uh, a lot of us learn to hold it by the handle. Problem is, when your hand is back here, you have less control over the blade because the part of the knife that's doing the cutting is up around here. If your hand's back here, you have to use more force to push this part of the knife forward. So if you sneak your hand up a couple of inches and gently pinch the knife between your thumb and forefinger, you're closer to that center point of the knife, that kind of center of balance, that's actually doing the work, right? Because when you cut, it's really that belly section that's doing most of the work. So get as close to that as you can comfortably. If you're a little afraid of the blade, you can sneak your hand back a little bit, but still hold it kind of right where the blade meets the handle there. Now this hand is the one that's probably gonna get cut if you're not careful. Um, when I learned to cut, I basically learned to grip, grip the food like so, and you know, finger up on the spine of the knife, and just to cut like that. And if your knife's sharp, that's fine, right? Does the trick. However, having your fingertips out like this makes them very vulnerable because all you have to do is lift that knife up half an inch or a quarter inch too high and suddenly you might be cutting your fingertip or your thumb, right? Your thumb can be sticking out there as well. So with the left or the non-dominant hand, I like to tuck these fingertips under. You see a lot of people, a lot of chefs doing this claw technique or the, you know, what's the matter you kind of grip. Basically, get those fingertips out and away so that they're under the first knuckle of your finger and not gonna get under the blade. Now, the part of my finger that's up front in the action is much higher up. And so I'm a lot less likely to get that under the blade. With this hand, scooch that finger off the spine there. You only need your finger on the spine when you're doing fine slices or when your knife's dull and you need to have extra pressure going downwards. With a sharp knife, you can just tuck that index finger right along the side of the blade there and help kind of guide the blade. Now, when it comes to actually cutting, I like to slide the knife forwards or sometimes backwards like so. When you look at a knife under a microscope, it kind of looks like a bread knife, a whole bunch of tiny little serrations. And so much like a bread knife, it works better by sliding than by pushing straight through the food. Again, sharp knife, not a problem. But when your knife starts to go a bit dull or you cut something a bit tougher like a tomato or pepper with a tough skin, pushing isn't gonna really get you anywhere. You may have learned your knife skills like I did on the Food Network, leaving the tip of the knife on the cutting board and coming down like so. And this is fine. This is great technique, right? There's a couple issues though. If you're just moving the knife up and down like a paper cutter like that, you have to kind of push the vegetable through and it's really hard to control the thickness of your cuts. Now, one thing you can do is get a little more sliding action and slide the blade like so. And that's gonna work a lot better. It's gonna allow you to move the knife sideways as you cut, but there's still an issue. To get part of the knife up over the food, if you're gonna leave the tip in contact with the cutting board, that means the other part of your knife has to be way up higher, which means if this gets anywhere near your fingers, you're more likely to get cut, and it's kind of awkward on the wrist, right? That kind of motion 
If you're making a quick dinner, not a big deal. If you're cooking a big meal, cooking holiday dinner, uh, or you're working in a restaurant, it's gonna get very tiring. So what I like to do is I leave the blade parallel to the cutting board. I start near the front of the knife and I slide the knife forward like so. Nice and easy. This allows me to, to kind of pull back and pause a little bit for each cut and aim the knife so that I'm getting consistent thickness with each cut. You can also draw the knife backwards if that feels more natural to you. Chances are this will feel a bit awkward at first, right? That's okay. Every skill takes practice. Nobody knows how to play guitar or do woodwork the first time. Same is gonna be, it's gonna be the same with knife skills, but luckily you cook most of the time, most, probably every day. So you'll have lots of opportunities to practice these skills. If you're cooking at home, it's not a race. So just take your time, uh, be patient, practice getting those cuts precise and smooth before you try to get fast. Now with this hand, because I do like to go for consistent cuts and this will come into play later, I'll explain why later, but we're trying to get a consistent size with each cut. And so I'll actually buffer side of the blade against that first knuckle of my index or my middle finger. And that'll allow me to guide the blade. And so when I bring the knife up for that brief pause, I can look over the top of the knife a little bit, especially when you're learning and you're practicing being precise before it's automatic. You can just pause for a split second and make sure each cut is gonna be about the thickness you want. It doesn't have to be perfect, but we're going for some degree of uniformity here. And then I just inch that hand back, slide it along the carrot a little bit with each cut. Once you got the hang of those two hands, just make sure you're comfortable at your cutting board, right? Some people like to cut straight across like this and kind of angle their body. That's fine, but make sure you're standing off to the sides so that your knife or your elbow isn't running into your body. For me, I feel most comfortable working with my carrot or my food at about 45 degrees across the cutting board, my knife going at 45 degrees, and the two meet in the middle at about 90 degrees. So I get a nice straight cut. This feels comfortable. I can kind of like loosen up and get, you know, get comfortable. And I'm just standing at the cutting board so that it's natural. Make sure your cutting board is at, at you know, as nice of a height as possible as well. A couple things to avoid um, before we get into all the skills. Things that dull your knives quickly. Cut on wood or plastic, they're softer, they're gonna help your knife stay sharp longer than glass or bamboo or granite, stainless steel. When you finish cutting, this is a bad habit that I have, and a lot of people do. When you finish cutting, you wanna move stuff across the cutting board, don't scrape like that. That is a bad sound. That is your knife dulling, because as you scrape across the cutting board, the edge is just going like that, and it's getting dull. So, chop, 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 and then either pick the knife up a little bit and just slide so that the edge isn't contacting the board or flip the knife over, use the spine. You can scrape all day and you're not gonna damage your knife. Other than that, just try to avoid coming down too hard on the cutting board because that the, the more uh, often and the, the more forcefully you come down on the cutting board, the faster your knife is gonna dull. And when it comes to picking up vegetables, right, to move them into a pot or container, just be really careful if you are using your knife. Um, you know, you wanna make sure you don't run that edge into your hand. Obviously, uh, you'll see me using a food scoop this whole time because it's easier and safer. You can use the knife, it's fine, but just be careful if you are using the knife that you're not running into your hand and you're not walking around your kitchen like this with a knife point sticking out towards somebody. Okay, boring part over. Let's learn some nice skills. First up, we're gonna do a dice. Uh, dice is a common cut that you use for a lot of different food. You can do different sizes of dice. I'm gonna start with kind of a medium to large dice. Uh, we're gonna do a carrot first. And there's two ways you can do this. I'm gonna show you the way I learned to do it in restaurants, uh, and then I'm gonna show you the way that makes sense. So first of all, we're gonna trim our carrot, and just, just trim as much as you need, right? Sometimes I see people trimming like an inch off the carrot. Just trim the part that you don't wanna eat and nothing else, because then you're not wasting. We're gonna try to square this carrot off so that we can get some nice consistent dice here. So we're gonna break it down into a few sections so it's more manageable, like so. And then we're gonna take our carrot. Now, anytime you're cutting something that's gonna roll around on the cutting board, that's gonna be harder to control, harder to be precise, harder to be safe. So, very carefully hold it in place and just slide the knife and cut a little flat spot in the carrot and then put it on the flat spot. Anytime you have something around, make a flat spot. It's gonna be easier to take hold of it and have control over it and you're just gonna be safer. This scrap, don't throw it away, eat it, throw it into chicken stock, whatever you want. Now that we have our flat spot, we are gonna to continue to square off the carrot so we have something that kinda of looks like a rectangle. Boom, boom, 
I'm trimming too much, but trying to make it fairly square. If I still worked in a French restaurant, I'd probably take more than that off. But this is something we have with like fairly parallel sides, basically a rectangular prism. Now you can make a, a large dice out of this and just boom, boom, boom. Got a large dice, right? Easy peasy. Uh, this is gonna go into a stew or something that's gonna cook for a really long time because it's a big piece. If we wanna do a medium dice, we're gonna take the same little carrot obelisk there and we're just gonna cut it in half. And then we're gonna cut those halves in half again, lengthwise. Try to be fairly consistent. And then you have a baton or a carrot stick, as we say in English. And then we're just going, basically, cutting cubes that are the same length as they are, as these pieces are wide. And now we have a small medium dice of sorts. So if you work in a restaurant, uh, uh, the kind of restaurant that cares about these sorts of things and uniformity, perfect sizes, perfect cubes, you know, um, then by all means do that. I don't work in a restaurant anymore. I cook for my family. So I'm not gonna do that. Uh, I'm not even gonna peel my carrot because the peel's fine. If it's a really gross carrot, maybe give it a wash, peel it if you want to, that's fine. I am gonna cut a little flat spot still, just for security's sake. But then I'm just gonna cut it in half without all that unnecessary trimming and then cut those halves in half again. And so when I make a soup or a stew or whatever, this is what my diced carrot looks like. It is roughly a cube, but not really, right? It's the same thing. It's gonna cook the same speed, and that's really what we care about here. Perfect geometric shapes are much less important than having consistent sizing. Long cook time, medium to short cook time. Right, makes sense. Now one piece of advice I have, if you're trying to learn to cook more like a professional, clean as you go, right? Have some containers on hand for your finished cut vegetables so that you can clear them out of the way and keep your workspace tidy. If this space is tidy and organized, then the inside of your head is gonna be tidy and organized. And that's important for having a successful cooking experience. Celery. If we're going to uh, just do a large dice, you know, probably just chunk it into some big pieces like that. And that's gonna be about about right for these big pieces of carrot. If we wanna go a little smaller, say we want a small dice of celery. Again, break it down into a more manageable length. And then we're just gonna to try to cut some celery sticks out of this guy. Just going for a roughly similar thickness with each piece. And then we're gonna stack this up and cut across it. Right, nice and easy, always sliding that knife getting a little bit of a rock because we're using a curved blade. Easy peasy. If you want to go for an even smaller dice of celery, you know, a, a, a small dice, fine dice, maybe even a brunoise, you can cut this guy in half because curved things, hard to get into squares. And then you can kind of fillet it into a thinner piece because this only gets so thin, right? Put it flat on the cutting board, put your knife parallel with the cutting board and bring it towards the edge of the board so you're not working over here because you want the handle of the knife hanging off the side of the board there. We're gonna put our fingers up on top of the celery, but we're gonna keep our fingertips up and away from what we're working on. Slide our knife in and then kind of watch and we're just gonna make sure we keep our knife parallel with the cutting board. Like so, and then as you get to the end, don't put your fingers in harm's way, just Flip them over, boop, like so. And then we can cut this into some thinner strips, right? And we can cut this as thin or as thick as we want. But if we're going for a finer cut, maybe we're making a really delicate soup or, or we're making stuffing and we wanna just sneak some celery in there so our kids don't notice, you can just make them nice and small, right? And then it's always gonna be easier if you make a little pile of stuff and cut it as opposed to cutting smaller piles at once, right? Try to manage as big a pile as you can with your knife without it being hard to cover with the length of the blade, if that makes sense, right? Okay, and then we have a pretty nice small dice. And this is great if you want food to disappear into a you know bolognese a little bit. Again, you're trying to sneak vegetables into your food because your kids don't want to eat them. That might be the case. Nice little, not quite a brunoise, but a nice 
fine dice, I would say. Onion time. We're gonna show you a couple ways to dice an onion. Uh, you're on the internet, you've probably seen these before, but let's cover them, make them easy, make them simple. Um, everybody's got an opinion about the right way to dice an onion. Here's two. Again, kind of a little bit off the top, not too much, but if you see the, see the brown stuff, just trim a little more. And then on the bottom end, we are just gonna trim a tiny bit of that root. We wanna leave most of that root intact because it's gonna to work to our advantage later. And then we're just gonna cut this guy in half. Again, we got a nice flat spot for the onion to sit on so it's not moving around while we're trying to cut it in half. And it is always easier to peel an onion after you've cut it in half than before. So always do it, always do things in that order. Onions have layers as uh, our good buddy Shrek has told us. So we don't need to work too hard to turn them into dice, right? The layers are already working this way. They kind of have the uh, horizontal axis covered. So we just need to work in the vertical uh, axes to kind of break things up. So we're gonna leave this root intact the whole way. What we're gonna do is take the front of our knife, the tip, and we're gonna push the knife kind of starting like 80% of the way back. We're gonna push it down and then draw it back. Down and back, down and back, down and back. And so we're leaving part of that onion intact. And if some pieces fall out, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Just pretend you're at Outback Steakhouse making a blooming onion. That's exactly what we're doing here. Working all the way across. And then some people like to do a, a horizontal cut into the onion like this. That's fine. But if you're a home cook, it can be a little scary and a little dangerous. So you actually don't need to do it all the way through. You can just do it along the sides of the onion here where you have those flatter sections. Just with the tip of your knife, just score that a little bit. And that'll be, that'll be plenty good enough. And then if you have any little scraps that escaped, just sneak them in under the onion there. And then we're just gonna cut across those cuts that we did first, perpendicular to them. Boom. As you get to the end, you're gonna get close to your fingertips. Don't overdo it, don't be a hero. You can lay you can lay that piece of onion flat, get a couple more cuts out of that, and then throw that into your chicken stock. If you keep a freezer bag with vegetable scraps, you can chuck it into there and then you can throw all that into a chicken stock. Okay, this next method is not my favorite, but a lot of people really like it, so it's worth showing to you. This cut basically works the exact same way as the vertical slices, but it's called the radial method because you follow the radius of the onion. You work kind of around the curvature of the onion. So same kind of cut, we wanna leave the back end intact. We wanna cut in towards the middle, just past the middle of the onion there. And we're gonna make each cut kind of following the natural lines or curvature of the onion. So tip, almost parallel with the cutting board, down into the onion. I'll try to show you guys better. Down into the onion, like that, right? And as we get further along, we increase the angle of the knife until we're at 90 degrees, boom. And then just be careful with your fingers coming down on the second side as we decrease our angle. Like so. And then you basically get the same thing, but this looks more like a blooming onion. Beautiful. And then just cut straight across. Is it perfectly consistent? No, does it matter? Absolutely not. Now this mixture that we have here, it's called mirepoix. 25% carrots, 25% celery, and 50% onion. This is the basis of a lot of French cuisine. It's kind of a nice flavor base. Um, you've got a little bit of sweetness from the carrot and the onion. You've got the beautiful flavor of onion, onion flavor, I don't know, whatever that's called. You have a little bit of kind of almost saltiness from the celery. And so when you're making a soup or a sauce, you want something to roast meat over top of. Uh, it's, it's a great base. Okay, we're gonna switch up our knife here, uh, cause why not, right? It's fun to mess around and try different knives. If you come and take this class in our stores, we have a bunch of knives for you to try. I'm gonna go for a Nakiri. Uh, it's a bit of a different looking knife. It's basically a vegetable knife. Flatter edge, so for those sliding cuts, it's really nice because you get a really clean cut without having to rock. And for the cuts I'm gonna do right now, it's gonna be perfect. All right, so that first bit, mirepoix, good for doing soup, stews, uh, again, a, a nice bed of vegetables to roast meat on top of. Now we're gonna cut vegetables that I would put in a stir fry. So earlier in the video, we were cutting our good old fashioned carrot coins, like it's the 1980s again. Maybe 
You want to get some carrot in your food and you want it nice and thin like this so it'll cook quickly. Stir fry, quick cooking. But you want it to look cooler than that. Um, and that size is a little bit awkward to pick up with chopsticks because it's quite small. So instead of running our carrot into the board at 45 degrees, we're going to run it across the board at about 9 degrees, just like on this kind of like horizontal line. The knife is going to still be at about 45 degrees. Again, using our finger to guide the blade and just sliding the knife forward. Once we get to a complete slice here, we're getting, yeah, like carrot coins, but with attitude. It's a longer, flatter piece, a little bit bigger, so much easier to pick up with chopsticks and a little bit cooler looking, right? Having the ability to cut things to different shapes and sizes just makes it more interesting to eat, right? If everything's cut into a square, yeah, sometimes that works if you're just making a regular soup or whatever. But if you're making something like a stir fry that's a little more of an exciting dish, uh, maybe you want to have vegetables that are a little more exciting. Maybe it'll get your kids to eat them. For the stir fry, we got a quick cooking method, quick, high heat. We're gonna go everything, pieces similar to this. Nice, longer, flatter pieces, easy to eat, uh, but cooks in just a couple of minutes. Once you have your bias cut carrots, you can turn them into a julienne really easy. A julienne is a, is a long, skinny matchstick. A lot of people think a julienne is quite a bit bigger, like a carrot stick, but it's actually a much smaller cut. Now, some people will take a carrot and they'll square it off and they'll try to cut these perfectly thin sheets. And it's just awkward and it's not really worth the work if you're not worried about absolute perfection. So I'll just take my bias cuts and I'll stack them up three or so at a time. And then I'll just slice lengthwise across them. Again, just rocking the knife a little bit to make sure we complete each and every cut. There you go, you have a beautiful julienne carrot. Uh, this is great if you're making pickled carrots, you know, you're making like a, a salad rolls or uh, maybe a banh mi, you wanna pickle some carrots, that's the way to do it. If you want a, a fairly fine dice of carrot, again, you can just line them all up like so, lengthwise. Just go back over them. And if you want carrot that's gonna disappear into your bolognese, then put it in the food processor, but you can also spend time and cut it this way. And when you're cutting a big pile of stuff like this that's really long, you don't wanna go all the way through in one clean motion. You can come back every now and then and kinda of like reorient your pile, just to keep it tidy. And that way it's easy to cut and you do get a, a fairly consistent. There's no chef yelling at us, so we can take our time. So with that in mind, we got our celery here. Uh, we could do the same kind of cut across like this. And let's just do some of those for the sake of demonstration. That's a great little, great little cut. We cut it the same way as our carrot, but we got a different shape. So how cool is that? We got a little Nike swoosh and a little disc. Alternatively, we could come in at a 45 degree angle this way to the cutting board as opposed to towards our body. So if we do that, we slice the knife. Again, working, I find this cut works best if you draw the knife back like this. If you're having a, if you're having a Trekkie over for dinner, it's a nice little Star Prize Enterprise, Star, Starship Enterprise badge. <laughs> Onions, we have fewer options of the onion, but I'm gonna show you a couple different ways you can slice an onion depending on what you're cooking and how you're cooking it. So again, we're gonna trim the top and the bottom of our onion off, cut it in half. This onion's a little worse for wear, so let's skip ahead while I manicure this. Remember, always keep your cutting board clean, especially if you're cooking something that has a non-edible part, you know, onion skins, you don't want them getting mixed in to your nicely diced onion. So clean the board off well, and then what you're eating isn't gonna be mixed up with like garbage. Now for this cut, we're just slicing the onion. We don't need to leave that root intact. We could trim it off this way, but then we're wasting a whole bunch of perfectly good onion. And, and with the price of groceries these days, or you know, even better if you grow your own vegetables, uh, you don't wanna be wasting stuff and throwing it away, even if you do compost. So we're just gonna use the heel of our knife, using our finger or thumb, the same hand just to guide it very carefully, like so. You could use a paring knife for this too, but a full-size knife works great. Like I said earlier, how we slice the onion is gonna change depending on what we're cooking. So as an onion grows, we have the root at the bottom, right? We have the bulb, and then we have the stem growing up above the ground. Uh, as it grows, it kind of grows lengthwise. And so you end up with these like long strands of fiber running through the onion from top to bottom. If you look closely at an onion, you can actually see the lines in it. And so th those can dictate how we cut the onion. If we cut 
with them in the same direction, the onion's gonna be firmer and more crunchy. It's gonna hold up better. So if you want, you know, if you're doing a stir fry, you want more crunch, or you're making a French onion soup and you don't want it to just be all one texture, you want a bit of more texture in it, um, then we can slice our onion lengthwise, right? If I'm doing fajitas, I'll probably do like this full length, but for stir fry, we want mm, a bit smaller pieces, so I'm gonna cut it in half across the lines, and then we're gonna cut it with the lines. Once you get to the end there, you're, you've got like a downward slope on the other end of the onion. And so I like to flip it over and just keep going. And once you get too close to your finger, don't worry about making it perfect, right? You can always break it down and, and trim up these pieces a little more if you want. There we go. It's just another shape to add to your stir fry arsenal. And it's again, a similar size and shape that's gonna cook at a similar speed to the rest of the stir fry. Good stir fry tip too is, uh, I'm not doing it right now, but keep your vegetables separate. So keep your onion separate from your carrot, separate from your pepper, separate from your celery, and cook the harder stuff first. Throw that in the pan, give it 30 seconds. Throw the next thing in the pan, give it 30 seconds. Because things cook at different speeds. And so if you stage them out like that, they'll all be cooked about the same. And uh, you won't overcrowd your pan, it won't cool the pan down, you will end up with a really steamy, watery stir fry. Now, the other way we can slice an onion, is against those lines. And that's gonna cause the onion to break down and dissolve more. So if you're making an onion jam, or you do want less texture in your soup, or you, know, you just really wanna cook it down, maybe caramelize onions, but you want it more like a paste, then you can just slice against these lines, generally nice and thin. This is generally how you'd wanna cut onions for a burger, or if you are a freak like me and you like uh, raw onion on your sandwich, a little onion in your grilled cheese, that's how I'm gonna slice that onion, right? Nice and thin, not, not paper thin, I mean you can, um, but if, if you just want it to be a little more palatable raw or you want it to uh, be, be much softer when it cooks, that's how you're gonna to wanna to slice your onions. Last vegetable for our stir fry is a pepper. Going back to knife skills we learned when we were young and my least favorite thing to do was work with pepper. Normally when you cut a pepper, you cut it in half and it just makes a mess. You get seeds everywhere and you have to go through and like pick them out one by one. And I hate tedious work. So I'm gonna show you how to not do that. We're gonna cut the top and the bottom off of our pepper. But we wanna leave the inside, the core where the seeds are intact. So we start by cutting far enough back, probably like half or three quarters of an inch into the pepper so that you see the inside and you have this nice piece left over, All right? Keep that off to the side, we're not gonna throw it away. Now the top, we just wanna cut off enough that we have this little ring on the top connected. And we wanna just cut through the bottom of this green base of the stem. So again, sliding our knife, like so. See, we left the core intact and that's what we want. So now we've got just a nice ring of pepper with the core on the inside. Take our knife, slide it into the pepper, make an incision, put the knife along the bottom there, and we're just gonna pull this way with our hand, and then kind of saw a little bit back and forth with our knife. And you can do this real quick if you want, it looks cool, but we're going for precision here, so we're gonna take our time. And there you go. There's all the seeds in the pepper. Throw that in the compost. These guys, you can use up, you can cut them however you want, dice them, julienne them. If you wanna have a little more fun with the pepper again, do some more interesting shapes for your stir fry. You could cut this guy in half and then cut it in half lengthwise. So you get these two longer, skinnier strips. And once again, do our bias cut where we bring the knife in at 45 degrees and just cut like so. And cut pepper diamonds. Beautiful, look at that. Or you can just julienne your pepper, right? If you're throwing it raw into a salad, or you're, again, you're making fajitas, julienning is a great way to cut a pepper. Julienne is just like a long, thin strip, like a matchstick. You could also go back across this julienne and make a dice, right? If we're doing that, that holy trinity, doing some Cajun cooking, that's a really easy way to make a small dice out of a pepper. If we wanna garnish off our stir fry with something, uh, we can do a julienne cut on some green onions. Much like the carrot, if you cut green onions into those little discs, um, you know, it's good for garnishing pierogies and stuff, but if you're trying to pick it up with chopsticks, 
It's kind of a small piece that gets lost easily. I find that's a good method for garnishing soups. If we're doing something that we're eating with chopsticks, we want a little longer, a little easier to grab. So we're just gonna take our green onion. We're gonna trim off the root end here and keep everything else. And we're just gonna do a bias cut like we did before, except instead of that 45 degree angle, we're gonna go for like a 75 degree angle. Really wanna decrease the angle of the knife to the food there so that we get a longer slice. And that's the cool thing about this bias cut is you can adjust your angle of attack up or down to get longer or shorter pieces. So it's, it's a very versatile cut. I find this is hard to do more than two or three green onions at a time. So just go easy, take your time. And then we have nice large pieces that we can finish up our stir fry with that are gonna be easier to grab and eat. All right, ginger. They didn't have ginger at the grocery store, so, well they did, it was tiny, $7. So, I grabbed this piece from my fridge. It's ugly, tell me about it in the comments. But we're gonna peel ginger, and the best hack for peeling ginger, if you don't know it already, is to use a spoon. Uh, it just removes less of the ginger than using a vegetable peeler or a knife. Basically, you just use your thumb to stabilize the ginger and then just scrape the side of it like so, and it removes just the skin of the ginger. You can use the spoon to cut in a little bit if you do have a piece that's a little gnarly. Cutting ginger is a lot like cutting anything else that we want to make into a consistent piece. We want to cut a flat spot so it doesn't roll around on us. And then we're going to use our knife. And this is where um, using this index finger to guide our cuts really comes in handy because we want to go for really thin slices, as thin as we can. I like ginger. I like intense ginger flavor. But if you got somebody with a bit of a lighter palate or you're going for a bit of a lighter flavor in your food, then you want to cut strong foods as thin as you can. This comes real in handy for garlic and hot peppers. Once we got all those flat sheets, we're just going to stack them up more or less. And much like doing a julienne, we're just going to do like a micro julienne. We're going to end up with these tiny, basically like threads of ginger, super, super fine. Now, these would be really good in just in food on their own. Like they're, they're small enough that you could just throw into a stir fry and it would be to me the perfect amount of ginger. But if we wanna work into a marinade or we want to blend into the dish a little more and distribute a little more evenly, we can go back across those threads. This is a, a time where it's helpful to leave the tip of the knife on the cutting board and just mince through that ginger and this is, this is effectively minced ginger. And I really like doing cuts like this, not because it's practical, but because it is a fun way to practice my knife skills. Uh, and <laughs> honestly, just not get too rusty in my case. But if you are trying to improve and better your knife skills, trying to do some really precise stuff like this will help you practice. If you don't have the time or the patience or the give a shit to do things that way, this is called a microplane and this is your best friend in the kitchen. Um, it's just a really fine grater, but it's the best one and the best brand. And you can use it for things like ginger. It takes a fraction of the time to make a really nice fine paste like that. I use it for ginger, garlic, nutmeg, Parmesan, so much stuff in my kitchen. Microplanes are the shit. Speaking of strong things with lots of flavor, garlic. Garlic's great, put it in everything. Put it in your dessert, it's my favorite. But garlic can be a bit of a pain to cut. Um, it's small, it's hard to break down and get into really small pieces. It's sticky when you do cut it down. So there's two ways that I like to approach it. Um, first of all, I like to smash my garlic, but if you set your knife like this and you whack on it like Ann Burl, uh, you're gonna mess up your knife. You're gonna bend your knife because it's flexing when you do that. So put the garlic near the side of the cutting board, put your knife parallel to the cutting board and just use the heel of your hand and just gently press like that. And then you got nice smashed garlic. And then all you have to do is cut across it and this will kind of naturally break it up into some pieces. So if you like slightly bigger chunks of garlic, if I'm just making a pasta sauce, you know, or a, a marinade, you know, it's not going into something that's gonna like burn on a grill. That's how I'll cut it up. But then you can just rock over it like so and make it smaller if you want to. When you do this rocking cut, don't press the knife into the cutting board and rock because then you're gonna tweak and, and dull and possibly even chip up the edge of the knife where it's contacting the board. So just keep your hand floating on top of that knife as 
you rock back and forth. Method number two, it's like Polly from Goodfellas. You know, making the pasta, you want the garlic to like disappear. It doesn't actually happen. But if you want nice thin slices of garlic, use that first knuckle right there, put the knife up flat against it, and then just bring your head down close to the cutting board and just slide the knife and maybe go less quickly than I am so you don't mess it up. It takes practice um, and it is impossible to do without a sharp knife. So make sure your knife is sharp. Method number three, microplane. Takes like 10 seconds and you have garlic paste. Done. Now say you wanna make a salsa. Um, tomatoes, great. They got a lot of water in them. So when you make a salsa or a bruschetta, there's a way that you can uh, work with your tomatoes so that it doesn't end up like watery and soupy. So you're gonna start by cutting your onion, tomato, same thing, in half like that, and then into a quarter, right? And then we're gonna take our knife and we're gonna kind of like parallel with the cutting board again. We're gonna use the tip of the knife and we're gonna score and we're gonna curve the tomato as we go. And we're gonna cut out the inside. Seems like a waste, uh, but this is where all the water is. Now you can use this part of the tomato, again, chuck it into a freezer bag, chuck it into like a beef stock, or uh, use it for tomato sauce if you make your own, or just next time you make pasta. Get any of the extra watery stuff out of there, and then skin side up or skin side down, whatever you like. If your knife's dull, skin side down. We're just gonna lay that flat and cut this into some nice sticks. Oh my God, this Guto is so sharp. This guy's brand new, haven't used it yet. It's awesome. And then we have a nice diced tomato for our, our salsa or our bruschetta or however you say it. And it's not watery. Uh, then you can add some you know, lime juice or you know, vinegar and it's not gonna end up really soupy. If we want to add some onion to our salsa or our bruschetta, we don't wanna do like a big dice like we did before. So we can do the same method we did before uh, with the dice and just make those cuts much closer together. So instead I'm gonna cut just a quarter of an onion and I'm gonna take two or three of these like petals, people call them, and I'm just gonna press it down flat. And then same with the tomato, but smaller. I'm just gonna cut little onion julienne. And if you want to pickle red onion, this is a really nice way to cut it. But for our purposes today, we're just gonna line them up and go back across, make a nice little fine dice or brunoise. And that's nice and small enough. You throw it on your McDonald's burger or you throw it on your bruschetta. It's not gonna be too strong. It's not gonna blow people's head off with how intense it is. You gotta, you gotta take that McDonald's up a notch. Okay, now we got some herbs. And I'll be honest, I think cilantro and parsley get mistreated a lot. Um, when I worked in, in restaurants and went to cooking school, we learned to chop our parsley really, really fine uh, until there was like almost nothing left. And when you have a delicate leafy herb like this, chopping it that much kind of destroys it. It, it. it damages too much of the flavor. And so what I like to do is um, be a little more gentle with it. Now, something like cilantro or parsley, there's two ways you can go at it. Uh, you can take the leaves, and chuck the stem or throw them into a stock or, or do whatever with them, right? Um, they generally have two little arms here and then a head up here. So you take the head off. Now, I like the stem in parsley and cilantro. Uh, I think it's got a lot of flavor. It's got a lot of texture. You know, you spend all this work to buy your groceries or to, or to grow them yourself and throwing most of it away is stupid. So I include the stems. Um, I just cut them really fine and they're great. They, they add more texture than the leaves do um, and help bolster that flavor. So regardless, if you're cutting the stems or the leaves, what you wanna do is kinda get things into a nice little pile there, don't mash them too much, and just gently cut across them like so, right? Nice and gentle. And I'm including the stems here. And then once you have the amount that you want, you, the rest can go in the fridge and you can just chop them a little more, right? You can do this kind of hache cut, but man, when I went to school, we were rocking it and going over as aggressively as we could, just mashing this parsley, and it was just depressing. And so I like to leave it a little bigger and a little leafier. That way you have bigger chunks of the herb and they're, they're, they're just gonna be better, right? Um, you know, even cilantro with a stronger flavor isn't gonna overpower in a larger piece, and, and then you're not damaging it. You're not destroying all the flavor by hacking at it too much. When it comes to the stems, like I said, I like to include them, and I just like to cut them nice and thin like so. Again, using my knuckle to guide the thickness of the cuts. 
rocking the knife. And this is a, a nice small piece of cilantro. So nobody's gonna complain about getting that in their food. And if they do, they don't deserve to eat at your house, right? But that mixes in really nice. It brings a nice green color to your food, adds a little more texture and dimension than just leaves do. All right, the last skill I'm gonna show you today is how to cut uh, a, a root vegetable or something dense like a squash. So I've got a sweet potato here. If you wanna peel it, you can. There's some kind of ugly spots on this guy, so I might take them off. I like the peel, but if you don't, just get a nice sharp vegetable peeler and, uh, and just peel the whole thing before you cut it because that'll make it easier. Something dense can be harder to cut through and it can be a little bit scary because you often need more force to cut through. These things are often also round and so they roll away, which when you've got a big knife and you're trying to push through it, it's dangerous. Like we did before, cut a little flat spot. You, we can use this, we can chop it up, but that way it's more secure. Try to find a narrower piece to cut through. If we try to cut through this lengthwise, we got a lot more surface area on the inside of this yam to get bound up in. And so we're gonna cut through the skinny side here. And essentially the technique, you don't wanna to use too thick of a knife, like a German chef's knife, because it's quite thick like an ax, and it's gonna wedge in. So instead I go for a Japanese knife, something fairly thin, and I start right up near the tip of the knife here, just about an inch away from the tip. And I'm gonna push down and slide the knife in a clean motion, but I'm not gonna like throw my whole body into it, right? You wanna actually be kinda of gentle. You wanna make sure you're up above the vegetable a little bit and ideally use a slightly larger knife. Push through, and if the knife gets stuck, just wiggle it out gently and go back to the tip there and just carry on. And if it gets really stuck, you can just gently roll it a little bit and that might help complete the cut. Now, our yam is a much smaller piece and it's twice as easy to cut through, right? Nice and easy. And then if we wanna dice it, Boom, like so. If you do have something like this that's a bit intimidating to cut, you can always microwave it for 20, 30 seconds first. That'll soften it up a bit. But using a, a decent sized knife, using a thinner blade, not too thin, but thinner than a really thick knife, and just getting a little bit of momentum on it, but using a sharp knife so that you don't have to force it too much. That's really the trick to cutting dense foods. Well, there you go. I hope now that you feel a little more comfortable and confident in the kitchen, especially if you just got into cooking or if you just picked up your first super sharp Japanese knife. Uh, if you, you know, think I missed something or if there's something I didn't cover you want to learn about, leave me a comment down below, but there's a good chance that I covered it in our advanced knife skills video, which you can go watch now. Um, I get into more intense techniques that aren't all that hard, but kind of break things down that seem a little bit intimidating and cover a bunch of the techniques that I didn't cover here today. If you live in Calgary, Edmonton, Ottawa, Vancouver, or Toronto, and you want to learn more, you can come and take one of our classes in person where we cover all these skills and more, and we cover them in person so you can actually get one-on-one -on -one coaching with us. If you are new to the world of Japanese knives and you want to learn a bit about how to take care of your knife after you're finished cutting, check out this other video on knife care. Happy chopping. Let me know in the comments what you cook.